In this video, we will see given an AES key and a piece of data encrypted with that key, how will you go about decrypting it? So we obtained the encrypted data in the first step and we needed three more steps to get the AES key or the file encryption key. This is the fifth and last step where we use the AES 256 bit symmetric key to decrypt the data. Before getting started on this, let's learn a few things about AES. If you are already familiar with AES, you can skip over this section. I have the video timeline in the description. So AES or the Advanced Encryption Standard is an algorithm that encrypts and decrypts your data. It takes in plain text and gives you ciphertext. It will also work the other way around. That is, if you send it the ciphertext, then you can get back the plain text. AES is a block algorithm or a block cipher, which means it processes data in blocks. As you can see here, AES will take 16 bytes of input and give you 16 bytes of output. If you want to get very specific, the input and output will actually be in hex and not in ASCII. I gave it an ASCII in this picture so that it's easy to understand. And the AES algorithm also needs one more input apart from the plain text. So the second input is the encryption key. This key can be one of three sizes, 128, 192 or 256 bits. The key length influences what happens inside the AES black box. In terms of data, it will always be 16 bytes of input and 16 bytes of output irrespective of the key length. So practically, if your data is less than 16 bytes, then it has to be padded to make it equal to 16 bytes. There are a few approaches or standards on how the input data can be padded. But for this discussion, let's not get into that. Okay, if your data is less than 16 bytes, then you pad it and make it equal to 16. But what if your data is more than 16 bytes? The obvious thing to do is just break it into slices of 16 bytes each and if the last slice is less than 16 then you just pad it right and you use the same key for all the blocks this way of using aes multiple times is called electronic codebook or ecb there is one significant problem with ecb though if there are patterns in the plain text then the cipher text will also carry those patterns but you know, one of the goals of encryption is that the cipher text should not be exposing any semantics about the plain text, right? So to avoid this, people came up with a new method called cipher block chaining or CBC. In CBC, the idea is to mix up the plain text before encryption so that there are no patterns. You can think of it like a XOR first and encrypt next scheme. What happens in CBC is you come up with something called the initialization vector which is just a set of bytes and it will be same as the input block length in our case the IB will be a 16 byte value what you do is you XOR the first block of plain text with the IV when you do this the first block of plain text gets mixed up then you send the result of this XOR operation for encryption after you encrypt the first block you will get 16 bytes of cipher text right you use the cipher text of the first block to XOR the second block of plain text. Then you send the second block for encryption. Then you take the third block of plain text, XOR it with the result of the second block's encryption. And you just continue till you reach the end. This way, the patterns in the cipher text will be diminished unless you reuse the same IV. One challenge here is uh, both the encryptor and the decryptor needs to know the IV. So the IV can be pre-shared or sent separately from the message. I hope that's not uh, too much of theory. So effectively what we have seen is uh, AES is a block algorithm or a block cipher. The input and output in AES is always 16 bytes. You can use a padding scheme in order to stretch the input if it is less than 16 bytes. And the key sizes in AES can be one of 128, 192 or 256 bits. When encrypting large amounts of data, that is something more than 16 bytes, we can use either ECB or CBC modes of operation. So a mode of operation is uh, nothing but a way of using AES repeatedly. So there are other modes of operation for AES, but it is outside the scope of what we are discussing now. And the last thing is AES in CBC mode uses a 16 byte initialization vector. Now let's get started.
Before starting to decrypt the file, I wanted to see if there is any information available on how the AES cipher is used in EFS. After a few minutes of searching, I found this Microsoft support article which dates back to 2012. The title of the article itself does not look very relevant, but if you scroll down, there is a section titled Cause. This section is actually a gold mine. It gives us three very important pieces of information about how AES encryption is applied to the file's data. So the first one is that EFS encryption encrypts file data in chunks of 512 bytes. Each chunk has a 16 byte initialization vector and AES is used in CBC mode for encryption. So what this means is one block in EFS will be 512 bytes. So to encrypt this EFS block, the AES algorithm will have to be called 32 times because at a time the AES can only encrypt 16 bytes of data. And since AES is used in CBC mode, there is an initialization vector that is used to jumble up the first 16 bytes of plain text by XORing it with the IV. The second block of plain text is jumbled up by XORing it with the cipher text of the first block and so on till it reaches the end of 512 bytes. Now that we have some understanding of AES and also about how it is being used in the encrypting file system, we will go ahead with the decryption of data. We can again use OpenSSL to do this. So this is the OpenSSL command we are going to use. Let's quickly walk through it. So we have the OpenSSL command followed by ENC. So ENC is a subcommand that can be used when working with symmetric ciphers like AES, triple dash and so on. In the next part, we specify the name of the cipher, which in our case is AES-256. And as we saw earlier, EFS uses AES in CBC or cipher block chaining mode. In the next argument, we specify that we are going to decrypt the data and following this is the name of the data file itself. Next is the key that needs to be used to decrypt this data. In our case, this is the FEK or the file encryption key. And the data is actually the data attribute of the file enc.txt. The last argument is the initialization vector. I have no idea what is the IV being used by EFS. So I will just set it as zero. Now, when I run the command on the file, you can see that the file gets decrypted partially and there is an error at the end of the file which says bad decrypt. If you look into the specifics of the error, it says wrong final block length, which if you think about it gives you a hint that the size of the data that we provided for decryption is not correct. Let's now open up the encrypted data in a hex editor and look at its size. So here we can see the size of the encrypted data is 621 bytes. We had seen earlier that AES encrypts data in blocks of 16 bytes. So the resulting cipher text must always be a multiple of 16. However, if I look at my encrypted data, so each line here is 16 bytes and in the last line, you can see that three bytes are missing, which means the encrypted data is not a multiple of 16. What is the source of the problem? If you watch the step one video, you might remember that we used the iCAT command from the SleuthKit toolset to extract the encrypted data attribute from the file. Maybe there is a problem in the tool. Let's actually try a different tool now and view the contents of the data attribute. So I'm going to use Active Disk Editor. Navigate to the file enc.txt and inspect its MFT record. I then get to the data attribute of the file and you can see that the data attribute occupies one cluster and it begins at cluster number 37. If I click on this cluster number, it takes me to the location of the encrypted data attribute in the disk. If I scroll down the encrypted data, it looks like EFS has encrypted the entire cluster even though the size of the input file is only 621 bytes. So the cluster size for this volume is 4096 bytes. Let me copy the entire cluster from here 
create a new hex file in 010 editor and paste the contents. You can just verify the size and see it is 4096 bytes or the entire cluster. Long story short, uh, I think this is a problem in the way iCAT command dumps an encrypted attribute. The iCAT command actually uses the attribute size information available in the attribute header. So when dealing with an encrypted attribute, maybe iCAT should dump the entire cluster instead of using this size information. Not sure if this would quantify as a bug, but I filed it in the SleuthKit project anyway. Uh, let's see how that one goes. So now I'm going to save the cluster file as data2.bin and then going to run the decryption command again. I just need to change the name of the file to data2.bin and uh, now it looks like we are getting a different error. Earlier I was getting wrong final block length. The new error seems to be more generic. I'm going to copy paste this error in Google and see where it takes me. I click on the first link in the search results. Looks like someone has faced a similar problem before. So there are four answers given. Let's uh, quickly take a look. First one says you are using incompatible versions of OpenSSL. The second answer says you are using the wrong key, which I don't think is the case. The third one asks me to try the notepad option with the OpenSSL command. And the fourth answer is totally talking about something else. Of these options, I think the third one to be reasonable, which is to try the command with the notepad option. So let's try the notepad option now. Okay, this time it works perfectly. Since we know that the decryption is fine, let's now redirect the output of this to another file and call it out.bin. I open this up in the hex editor again, and uh, we know that the size of the plain text is uh, 621 bytes. So in my decrypted output, I only need the first 621 bytes. We can discard the rest of the data. So I will go to byte number 621 in the file and delete the rest of the file, which is just filler data. The last part of the decryption problem is the IV or the initialization vector. Let's review our observations we had about how AES encryption is used in EFS. The input file is divided into 512 byte chunks. Every 512 byte chunk has a unique 16 byte IV. So now if you look at the file, you can see that the first 16 bytes of the file are not decrypted properly. This is so because I did not know the IV and I just gave the IV as zero in the OpenSSL command. But if you look at the rest of the 512 bytes, the contents are getting decrypted properly. And starting with the next 512 bytes, you can see there is a problem decrypting the first 16 bytes again, right? So what we can see is the initialization vector impacts the decryption of the first 16 bytes of the block in a block cipher. So this block I'm talking about is the EFS block, not the AES block. So the EFS block is 512 bytes in size and not knowing the IV does not impact the decryption of the subsequent data in the block. So the first 16 bytes are not decrypted, but the remaining 512 minus 16, which is 496 bytes are getting decrypted properly. Now let's see if we can figure out the IV. There are two questions you might have at this stage. The first one being, what is the IV used by EFS? And the second question is, where is the IV actually stored? Is it in the registry? Is it stored with the file? Or is it stored in some separate EFS database, right? So of these two, the first question is easier to answer. Now, what we are seeing in the first 16 bytes of the decrypted file is the XOR of the plain text and the IV. In this case, we already know the plain text. So it is easy to get the IV. To understand how, let's take a 30 second overview of XOR. So XOR is a bitwise operation that produces zero when the inputs are equal and produces one when the inputs are different. Since XOR is a bitwise operation, when you want to XOR two values, you convert them to binary and then perform the XOR operation on each of the corresponding bits. Also, you can see that the XOR has a few properties. The first one is that anything XOR with itself will be zero. So A XOR A is all zeros. The second property is anything XOR with zero will remain the same. So A XOR zero will be A. Lastly, 
XOR is commutative. That is, the XOR of A and B XOR C is same as A XOR B being XOR with C. I think it is easier to read than listen to what I just said. Now, coming to the problem that we are trying to solve, what you see here is the first 16 bytes of the decrypted file, which is the jumbled text. So this jumbled text is basically the XOR of the plain text and the IV. Now, to get the IV, we can do something simple. I will XOR both sides with the plain text. So, on the left, we have the jumbled text XOR plain text. And on the right, we have plain text XOR IV, XOR with the plain text again, right? So, the right hand side can be rewritten as plain text XOR plain text XOR IV. And plain text XOR plain text is basically XORing a value with itself. So it will be 0. So we can rewrite this as 0 XOR IV. And you know that if you XOR anything with a 0, then you get the same value. So what we get on the right hand side is the IV. The moral of the story is that if you can XOR the jumbled text and the plain text, you can get the IV used by EFS. In our case, we have both the plain text and the jumbled text. Let's XOR them. So I'll be doing this online using the site XOR.pw so that it's easier. Let me copy the first 16 bytes of the decrypted file as a hex value and paste that as the first input. Now for the plain text, I just open up the original file and copy the first 16 characters. I give this as the second input and set the input type as ASCII. When I click on calculate XOR, I can see the result. So this should be the IV that we have to use. Let's try it out. Okay, now it looks like the first 16 bytes are getting decoded perfectly. So that completes the decryption of the first EFS block. However, it looks like we failed to decrypt the first 16 bytes of the second block. Now this is getting a bit uh, frustrating because I have an uh, IV value that I found and I'm not sure where this is getting stored. And secondly, the IV seems to vary for each block. After some head scratching, I remembered that uh, there are open source implementations of NTFS. So I decided to do some targeted searches on Google and then look through the source code. So what I found in this file NTFS decrypt.c was quite interesting. Looks like EFS uses a hard-coded IV. What this source code is trying to tell you is essentially this. The initialization vector for AES has two parts. Both parts use a hard-coded value to which you add the relative sector offset of the encrypted data. You know that EFS encrypts data in 512 byte blocks. So for the first block, the relative sector offset will be zero. For the second block, it will be 512. For the third block, it will be 1024 and so on, each incrementing by 512 and the IV is obtained by appending the parts 1 and 2. So with all this understanding, I wrote a simple Python script that takes in the encrypted data and AES key as input, applies the IV for every 512 byte block and decrypts the file. I have this script posted on my GitHub along with all the other files that I have used in these videos. So if you want to try out any of these steps with the same files, you can do it. With all that, we come to the end of this video. So this video turned out much longer than I expected it to be. But uh, I just wanted to capture the thought process behind this rather than just showing the results. So in summary, we started with an overview of AES and saw how AES is used by the encrypting file system. Then we started our decryption process using the AES key. We went on to fix some open SSL errors, like we had an error because the encrypted data was not a multiple of 16, and then we had to use the notepad option and so on. We then moved on to an overview of XOR and saw how to figure out the IV. Lastly, we wrapped up with a script that can decrypt EFS blocks when they are encrypted with the AES key. So that will be all. Uh, thanks for watching.